What if you could wake up anywhere on the West Coast, go to work for a few hours, and at about lunchtime, head to the airport and catch a two-hour flight to Tokyo? <laughs> Arriving morning their time, afternoon our time, you could have a business meeting and return home in time to sleep in your own bed the same day. Or what if you could order sushi on Amazon Fresh one afternoon <laughs> from Tokyo chef Jiro Ono and receive it in time for dinner? Yes, that would be an expensive dinner, <laughs> but it would be good. Or perhaps most exciting of all, what if you could hop on a space plane, not on a rocket, and fly into orbit for a space vacation or to catch a connecting flight to Mars? Well, this has been my dream for 30 years, but for me, it's been more than a dream. For the same 30 years, I've enjoyed working on things that will transform this dream into reality. Now, my dream was born in 1986. I had a couple months to go before finishing my PhD research in hypersonic aerodynamics when I heard President Reagan in his State of the Union address talk about the Orient Express, a project to develop a hypersonic airplane that could take off from Dulles Airport, accelerate to Mach 25, and attain Earth orbit or fly to Tokyo in two hours. I was hooked. The roots of my dream extend back farther to the sixth grade. Not content, this is when I started to learn about technology in school. Not content to just read about it in a textbook or look at pretty pictures. I would go home after school and make working models of these things from scrap materials in my father's workshop. I'd then take them to school the next day and show the kids, my fellow classmates, how they worked. This led to an extreme curiosity, interest, and fascination with flight and how things flew. And this passion drove me before long to college to study aerospace engineering, which leads me back to the Orient Express. The Orient Express was actually the national aerospace plane, a national project to develop a single stage to orbit space plane. But the it was too technologically ambitious. We spent eight years on it. We did not succeed. And even today, with today's technology, we still can't get to orbit in a single stage without dropping empty fuel tanks along the way called staging. But despite it not achieving its full goals, it did three very important things. It developed and matured scramjet engine technology, advanced design tools, and high temperature materials. I'm going to talk to you briefly about the first two. The key to routine hypersonic flight is the supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet. This was an idea that was actually conceived almost 60 years ago, but it hasn't been till recently that it's been proven in flight. Now, unlike a turbojet or a turbofan that uses propeller-like blades to compress the air before burning it, a scramjet, like its lower speed cousin, the ramjet, uses shock waves to compress and slow the air created by flying faster than the, the speed of sound. Now, if you, if you try to use a turbojet or a turbofan above about Mach 3, air friction would make the blades so hot they would melt, so you can't use it. Switch to a ramjet, but if you go above about Mach 5, the air has gone through so many shock waves, the airflow has actually gone subsonic in the combustor where you burn it, and the pressure and temperature are too high for it to work properly. So we solve that by pushing the air through, processing it through fewer shock waves. We let it stay supersonic. We burn the air in a supersonic flow. Now, if you've ever tried to light a match in a breeze, you know how hard that is. Imagine trying to light a match in a supersonic hurricane. That is our challenge. Now, a scramjet is fundamentally simple. It's just a shaped pipe. But the details of that shape are very, very important. We have to shape the inlet to compress the flow just enough, but not too much, through shock waves. The air is in the engine for only one brief millisecond. In that one millisecond, a thousandth of a second, we have to inject fuel, get it to mix completely, ignite, and burn to completion. That's incredibly difficult to do. We do it through flow turbulence. 
And turbulence is fundamentally difficult to understand and even predict using advanced computational methods with computers. So even though the shape is, the scramjet is fundamentally simple in its, in its shape, the physics behind it are very complex. It's little wonder that it's taken almost 60 years to uh, prove, it's taken so long to prove that they work. Now, what's the benefit of a scramjet for high-speed flight? The benefit of a scramjet over a rocket is a rocket has to carry its own oxygen. A scramjet, like any jet engine, just uses the air, it breathes air. So that fuel economy benefit is illustrated in this plot. It's called, it's a plot of specific impulse as a function of speed or Mach number. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. Specific impulse is just the thrust that the engine produces divided by the fuel flow rate, the fuel that's used to generate the thrust. So you want high thrust, low fuel flow rate. You can see in the green, that's turbofans, that powers our commercial airplane way high fuel economy compared to the red band, which is rocket engines. Now, as you go up in speed, you go to ramjet and scramjet, the specific impulse decreases. It's because thrust decays as you go to higher speed, but it's still everywhere higher than a rocket. And that's the benefit. Now, the first time a scramjet was proven in flight was in 2004 on NASA's X-43A experimental vehicle. This test vehicle, 12 feet long, was carried aloft by a B-52 bomber. It was attached to a huge uh, booster, rocket booster, carried out over the Pacific Ocean. It was dropped. The booster boosted it to Mach, almost Mach 7 in one flight and almost Mach 10 in the second flight. After the booster burned out, it was pushed off. The engine was lit, and it burned hydrogen for about 10 seconds, which is all it could fit. And the vehicle accelerated as predicted. After almost a half a century, the theory of scramjets was finally proven. Now, let's jump forward to 2013. And if you would, for a moment, imagine you're on the team trying to create this next giant leap in hypersonics, in hypersonic flight. Okay, so we're in the control room at Edwards Air Force Base. The tension is palpable. You're very excited, incredibly nervous, the anxiety is almost excruciating. You've been here before, three times. In 2010, you tried and partially succeeded, but not completely. The next two times, you failed. This is the last vehicle you have, the last chance you have to, to do this mission. Now, you've been in the control room for hours waiting for the right conditions, which just added to the stress and anxiety. Now, let me take you to the cockpit of an F-18 fighter jet at 50,000 feet over the Pacific Ocean. We're going to watch this flight unfold together from that cockpit. So this is the US Air Force X-51 Wave Rider scramjet engine demonstrator. You see it drop off the B-52. It's attached to a booster. The booster accelerates it from 50,000 feet Mach 0.8 to 60,000 feet Mach 4.8. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see it ascending. Eventually, you'll see a little pigtail, a little white pigtail come off the back. That is the booster being ejected off of the scramjet. Watch carefully. There it goes. Now what you see is the world's first scramjet contrail, the first in history. Success, cheers, hooray, high fives in the room, we did it. It was awesome. Now, the, the, the X-51 continued to accelerate for three and a half minutes, going from Mach 4.8 to 5.1, until it ran out of fuel. In that amount of time, it, it traveled 200 miles, which is about a mile per second, or twice as fast as a speeding bullet. At that speed, you could fly from LA to New York in about 45 minutes. Now, what was different between this and the X-43? The X-43 was heavy, it was like a flying wind tunnel model. It used hydrogen fuel, but it did break the record. It was the first flight of a scramjet. This vehicle was lightweight, as light as you would norm for a real airplane. It burned jet fuel, not hydrogen fuel, and it broke a new record, the longest scramjet flight in, in history. This event was particularly, this success was particularly sweet to me because the X-51 was my baby. I conceived it, uh, the concept, in 1995 and led the early design team. 
Now this was the culmination, the, 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 the dream of hundreds of people was finally realized in the flight of this practical scramjet. Now, scramjets are hard to design, but the vehicles that they power are equally hard to design. The reason is they're what's called highly integrated. Now, a conventional airplane has distinct wings and body and tails, engine, but a hypersonic vehicle has to be blended and highly integrated. Why is that? Well, it's because, it, because the engine actually has to be so big. Remember that specific impulse plot. Remember as the speed gets up, the thrust goes down. Well, if the thrust goes down, the engine has to get bigger and eventually gets so big that it's a flying engine. And that's depicted in this example here. The whole bottom of this vehicle is the scramjet engine from the nose to the tail. The blue part up front we call the forebody. It grabs air and shoves it through the engine. The red part is the no part of the nozzle. It expands flow and creates thrust. So the entire bottom is engine. But not only that, it's also a wing. You don't really see distinct wings here. So that engine also generates a large portion of the, of the lift of the vehicle. It's a blended wing and engine. Now, traditional conventional aircraft are designed by a conventional design technique that dates back to the Wright brothers. You design each of the pieces, the wing, the body, the tails, the engine, you bolt them together. But a highly blended vehicle, uh, you cannot use that approach. It, it, it really doesn't work very well. That's because all the po parts and components and functions are highly inter interconnected and they interact strongly. One affects the other very strongly. This creates what I call the whack-a-mole problem, okay? So what this is, if I go try to optimize one of these parts, it could and tends to make the others worse. So while I'm whacking on one mole, new moles pop up. And so the whole process, I'm going around whacking moles, and I never converge in the design process. It requires a new method of design, and we came up with a method called multidisciplinary design optimization, where we consider all the disciplines together. We don't just design or optimize the wing, we do it all together. And I use this process to design the X-51, which as best I know was the first time in history that MDO was used to design a real flying vehicle. Now this, is, this illustrates the um, method that I and my colleagues developed, MDO method to design hypersonic vehicles. It starts by um, creating a mathematical description of the airplane. So what does that mean? Well, it's a model where we use variables like dimensions, width, length, height, angles, curvatures to define its shape. It typically de, uh, requires 100, 200 of these variables to define a complete shape. Now, since they're all highly interrelated, we can't optimize all of them. But today, we can optimize about 25 of them. Well, let's see what this, this leads to. If I have 25 variables I'm trying to optimize, and they're coupled, and I pick three values of each one, I'll end up with a, a combination of 850 billion vehicles I have to analyze to find the one. That's the, I call that the needle in the haystack problem. Finding that one needle. Well, that's twice the number, more than twice the number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. That's an impossible task. So what we do instead is we use statistical techniques, in this case design of experiments, to search design space and, to, and just pick some select points out of design space. So instead of billions, we're down to a few hundred or maybe a couple of thousand. We then automate the analysis process. We take all those disciplines, link up all the computer tools, and, and automate that. So we put in a, a vehicle design, and out pops its performance. How much does it weigh? How far does it go? How much does it cost, et cetera? And now we've got a sparse representation of the, of the behavior of design space. And we curve fit it. We, we, fill, in, we fill in those dots with, with mathematical curves called curve fitting. Now, what this is like is, so we do the analysis process. Let's say we predict cost for hundreds of vehicles, and then we fit all that. What we now have is, with 25 variables and one output cost, we have a 26-dimensional mountainscape. And our job is to find the highest peak in that mountainscape, or the lowest valley, in this case, the lowest cost. And we use mathematical optimization tools to efficiently search that mountain space in multiple dimensions to find the best vehicle. Now, what is this? What's the result of this? Here's a great example. The vehicle labeled baseline here was the result of eight years of whacking on moles on that national aerospace plane, essentially. After a month of MDO, you see the optimized shape. It's smaller, 
it looks a little different, and it's it's 40 percent lighter, which is a, a, a huge significant effect. Now, this technique can be applied to lots of things. Any kind of an integrated system can use MDO, whether it's an automobile, an electronic system that's integrated, or even a medical treatment regimen. Now, with all this exciting hypersonic technology, what might we do with it? Um, there's been a lot in the press these days about space travel. NASA and SpaceX tout plans to fly to Mars. Elon Musk of SpaceX has even talked about colonizing Mars, and Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin wants us to become a space-faring nation with millions of people living and working in space. But there's some real challenges to these dreams and these goals. One of the biggest is the cost of just getting payload into orbit. Today, with expendable rocket systems, it costs about $10,000 to put one pound, something you can hold in your hand, into orbit. Now, think about it. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to take people and fuel and food and spaceships and everything they need to go there and come back safely. It's, it's tons and tons of mass. And just to put that stuff into orbit, it's going to cost tens of billions of dollars not accounting the cost for designing it, building, and operating it. So this is severely limiting. So how do we solve this problem? We've studied it, and we've uh, learned that there are two key factors to dramatically reducing the cost of getting to orbit. We could reduce it by 50 or 100 times. The two factors are the system has to be completely reusable. You can't throw anything away. Kind of makes sense. And it has to have a high utilization. Which means, after a mission, you need to be able to come home, turn it around quickly, and use it again at a high rate. It's not enough to just reuse the first stage. It's not enough to refurbish a, a stage, taking weeks or months to get it ready for a next flight. It really has to operate more like an airplane. It has to have aircraft-like characteristics. Now, what you see here, there's, there's lots of possible ways of solving this problem, lots of different design concepts. You see a few here. The stages might be powered by rockets, air-breathing engines like scramjets, or a mix of the two. The ultimate solution is going to be the design and the technology set that achieves those goals of complete reusability, 100%, high utility, utilization rate, at the lowest purchase price. Now, if we master affordable space flight, it will naturally follow, it could naturally follow, fast global transportation. Conversely, if we design a hypersonic transport, it could serve as the second stage of a two-staged orbit vehicle. But there's challenges to achieving this goal of high-speed flight. Chief among them are environmental challenges. Um, emissions, uh, the exhaust, carbon dioxide, and even water, greenhouse gases, sonic boom, challenges. The solution to these challenges may lie in the future of energy technology. Now, let's look far down the technology road. I believe that harnessing some form of safe nuclear energy will be the ultimate solution for powering hypersonic airplanes and even spacecraft. Perhaps a device that can store a sufficient amount of antimatter and annihilate it in a controlled way to create pure energy according to Einstein's famous E equals MC squared would be the ultimate portable power device. It would be similar to a real life version of the arc reactor that Tony Stark used to power Iron Man. At an, amazing, huh? At an energy density a billion times greater than jet fuel, it would eliminate almost all the weight of the jet fuel, which for a hypersonic vehicle can be 65% of the takeoff weight. 100,000 pounds of jet fuel could reduce to a tenth of a gram of antimatter. Amazing. And with so much energy available, the extra drag of supersonic or hypersonic flight would be all but irrelevant. And excess energy that you carry aboard could actually be beamed ahead of the aircraft to create a thermal spike, what we call a thermal aerospike, that could make the vehicle look way longer than it actually is, which would mitigate and maybe even eliminate sonic boom. So this is far out there, but it's stuff, this is technology people are working on, and I believe it is the ultimate solution. So, just as the first successful flight of, by the Wright brothers led to 100 years of amazing breakthroughs and to affordable global travel for vast numbers of people, 
Our first air-breathing hypersonic flight is a preamble to the next age of flight. After decades of failed attempts, we finally succeeded and opened up the age of hypersonic flight. Routine hypersonic flight will shrink the globe. It will bridge air and space, making access to space more affordable and create a new era of space exploration, space industry, and even possibly space colonization. The dreams of faster flight and space travel are converging and creating uh, an exciting future where new dreams at the edge of the imaginable are ready to be realized. Thank you very much.